Welcome to Celebrate Life. My name is Gary DeCarlos and I am your host. The inspiration for this series is to show the amazing lives people live. The key word here is live. I hope to capture through interviewing many wonderful Vermonters and even a few people outside Vermont, some stories of their lives and experiences to our audience while they are still very much alive. Over the years, I have read too many obituaries that left me pondering, why did I not have a chance to meet this person while they were alive? The goal of this program is to celebrate the lives of everyday Vermonters while they are still with us. Some people will be recognized by many viewers and lots of the people I plan to interview will be known by only a few close intimate group of friends and family. I will guarantee that all the people who are interviewed will have fascinating stories to share with you. You see, I am of the notion that everyone has a story to tell. If you would like to be interviewed or know someone who you think would be like, would like to be interviewed, please contact the CC TV channel coordinator, Jordan Butterfield. This information will be posted at the end of the show. Also, if you find yourself wanting to follow up on this interview and have a question for the interviewee, you can write the CCTV channel coordinator with your question and he will reach out to the interviewee for a response. Make sure you also leave your contact information, telephone and email address. Thank you. Now, it's a great honor to introduce Peter Edwards. Peter is a friend, a writer, editor, senior consultant, team, project team leader, logistics professional, and a lifelong learner. I've had the honor of knowing Peter for some 30 years at this point. Welcome, Peter. Hello, how are you? Good. Good. Now, when I first met you, you already were working with large federal agencies, including the one I was in, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. Yes. Um, and uh, doing some amazing work at that level. Um, but I know there is a whole life pre that, that um, I, I'd love the, the audience to hear about. Where did you grow up? What, what was your life like as a young boy? Well, um, I was um, born in a, um, in a Jewish hospital. Um, because my mother had two children in a Catholic hospital and they didn't provide any kind of um, um, medication to help with the pain. So when I came around, that was the end of that. So um, I was born at Menorah Mayor Medical Center in Kansas City, Missouri. Your mother's a smart woman. <laughs> well, yeah, after two kids, she figured it out. <laughs> So um, I am a, well, my siblings and I are first generation Catholic um, in our family. There's other Catholics in the family. Um, so we went to parochial schools and to, into high school. Um, my first year in um, high school was at Bishop Hogan. And then I went to a public school in the suburbs of Kansas City. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I sang with a uh, boys and men's choir called the Pontifical Choir of Greater Kansas City, um, starting out as a child as a soprano and finished as a tenor. Um, mm -hmm. I sang with them for nine years until I went to college. Wow, I didn't know that part of you. Amazing. Well, I guess we should do an interview then. <laughs> and here we are. And here we are. Uh -huh. So when you think about that, your your Catholicism. What, mm -hmm. Any impact that on terms of who you are as a as a man now? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, well, I I am I I be, I am I believe in my faith. Um, I believe in God and Jesus Christ and and the teachings of the. Um, Roman Catholic um, institution, um, Roman Catholic Church. Um, I I have some different opinions about things um, because I don't think any one body could speak for any one person in the world. So, um, but I I I like the traditions. Um, I take comfort in the traditions and the things that we do annually. In so um, 
I grew up to be a good Catholic boy. Mm -hmm. What are some of the differences, Peter? What are some of the things that, you know, even though you're obviously a very devout Catholic that you might feel different about than what the church is talking about today? Well, um, I think my first exposure to um, something being different was when I went to school in Southern Missouri for college um, and I ran into Southern Baptists um, and who were um, um, born again Christians. Um, and um, they, they were telling me that um, I, I couldn't be saved because they actually didn't think that a Roman Catholic could be um, a Christian. Um, I disagreed with that. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that, was, that was very interesting to go through that process. Um, being, being um, something different than what the norm was saying um, in the, the city of Joplin, Missouri. Um, right. But um, I, it, I, I enjoy being a Catholic. I enjoy, um, it, it's a celebration. And, and so it's something that, that is just deep down in me. Did uh, any of the lives of the saints um, capture your imagination? Um, no, not really, um, because I don't have that, you know, um, long-term history of the saints and what they did and stuff like that. Gotcha. Um, so, um, no, but um, um, I do believe, and actually in my religious group now, I, I, I continue to say the rosary. Um, twice a week, and we we pray for, you know, the sick, the ill, and the dying, and um, and even though it's done um, remotely online because of the the pandemic, um, it's very real, um, and and I'm I'm inspired by the other people in our group who are saying the rosary, and I mean I I'm in, I'm just inspired by uh, people who who enjoy practicing their faith. Mm -hmm. So one of, the, one of the strange things about it is that um, a lot of my friends aren't Roman Catholic outside my church. So um, when I'm in an all Catholic environment, like with my family or my cousins, um, it, it's such a relief that I don't have to explain things. It's such a relief that you know, we can just simply say grace um, and, and not have that be uh, an odd thing or yeah. you know, what does that mean or yeah. anything yeah. Like that, so. The comfortability there, it, yeah, exactly. absolutely, yeah. Right. When uh, you were a young child, uh, did you have any heroes, any people that kind of you looked up to or? Um. Well, I, I realized I lived a pretty sheltered life. Um, and I think that was by design by my mother. Um, I grew up in the 60s. Um, um, so there was a lot of turmoil and strife and, and um, things going on in the city. And I think one of the reasons my mother uh, put her children into the Catholic Church was to protect us from the evils of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember one time, um, come, uh, the, the, the school um, had all the parents come to give kids rides home. And, and I was confused. I was thinking, you know, we only live three blocks away. Why can't we, we do that? But all the parents were there and, mm -hmm. and cars and, um, my mother came home and said that they were rioting in, in Kansas City. And at that time, I didn't know what that meant. But I think um, that, that, that is the, 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 it was her way of protecting us gotcha. from things going, going on because um, the world wasn't very nice to um, um, African Americans or Black people at that time, and right. Um, so, right. So I'm not sure if I'm getting to your answer. Yeah. So, but. but let's let's talk about, if you wouldn't mind, talk about 
being an African American in Kansas City, Missouri, um, did this was the school? Um, did you feel any less or more than anyone else there? What, what was it like being in a Catholic school? Your mother might have had you go there for the idea of being protected a little bit, a little safe from what was happening on the streets of Kansas City. Did, was that actually? Did that actually happen? Um, yes, very much so. Um, and um, oddly enough, one of the things that that um, came about was that um, um, even though there were other neighborhood kids, um, 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 my mother preferred that we would play with our friends from the Catholic school and and not necessarily the public school kids. You know, mm -hmm. they're always tempting you to eat, you know, a hamburger on Friday or something like that. But um, <laughs> no, it it was um, it was a I, I had a I had a fairly innocent childhood, um, and um, it doesn't it, it although it doesn't mean that there wasn't um, tragedy or are not tragedy um, difficult things, but. Um, for the most part, I wasn't exposed to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, what did you want to do when you go on? So, so, so to go back to your question about um, 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 growing up, I, I, I just, I just recently discovered with my brother, um, we moved to our neighborhood, the, the neighborhood that that I had. I started kindergarten um, um, in what was the suburbs. Um, um, and I just found out with my brother like this year that I thought we were the second black family in the neighborhood. Um, he says that we were a third and since he's old, I mean the first, and since he's older, I have to believe him. Mm. There, there, weren't, there weren't many black families in there. And mm. as a child, I didn't realize that that was odd. Mm. Um, everything was just normal. Um, mm -hmm. So I didn't have that differentiation um, until later on. Um, but at the same time, um, I discovered things about my mother um, later in life, especially after she died. She died in 2003 um, because of recent events. Um, I realized that my mother was teaching my brother and me how to behave in society when she wasn't there mm -hmm. by giving us what everyone knows now as the talk, you know, mm. don't do this, don't do that. But I didn't know that that's what she was doing. Right. It wasn't until I was in my 30s and I was talking to some of my friends out here in Washington, because I moved out here after college, that I realized that not everyone's parents gave them that mm. sort of instruction. Mm. And, I, and I thought, well, what's up with that? Mm. So I, I recently um, wrote a paper for my church um, because I realized certain things were the the my my religious community it's a Catholic com community and it is predominantly um, 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 no northern European and and I realize that there are things even though I see myself as an equal and I think they see myself as an equal there's not there's not an equality there because I've experienced things that they've never had to experience. Um, and so that's when I realized that I, I wrote about um, the, the subtleties of racism when I was growing up um, and how they, they, they come from nowhere and you really don't have any idea what's going on until you figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think it's interesting that I wrote this, this essay, it was a three-part essay um, that I've sent to you yep. Um, yep. that was written in January of 2020. And as you well know, um, all sorts of things happened in 2020 that um, right. 
sadly echoed mostly everything I wrote in my essay. Yeah. yeah. So as much as your mom tried to protect you from some of the prejudices, racism of the day, it still exists today, obviously. Um, you experienced that as a young child too. Yes. Can you talk about any of that? Well, yes. And actually it, it's something that my sibling, my sister and brother, I, I have um, two siblings. Uh, my sister's the eldest, my brother is, is the middle and there's only um, three and a half years separating us. Um, I'm realizing more and more that their experience with racism has, has been there. Um, it's just something that we didn't talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, to get back to your question, um, which actually I forgot what your question was. Well, I just want you know, as much as your mom was able and trying to protect you from a lot of the not so terrific stuff um, of the time, uh, as an African American young man, I, if you could uh, share a, an experience or two that you did have with that um, racism raising its head in your life, um, prejudice. Okay, a perfect example of that is um, um, my mom remarried, and we moved to Kansas, and it's. Um, it's it's right on the um, state line, so the, the whole metropolitan area of Kansas City is right there. One side's on Kansas, one side's on Missouri. Right. Um, I was in a suburban school, and um, um, one of the things that my mother um, told my brother and me in particular, um, I guess because she didn't have to worry about her daughter, but she always said from the earliest age I can remember, after high school, you're either going into the military or going into college, and you're not going into the military. So I always knew I was going to go to college. Right. Um, when I went to a suburban white high school, um, entering into the system, um, not from you know kindergarten or anything, but just entering as a sophomore, um, my guidance counselor was putting me into shop classes or mm -hmm. into vocational classes. And um, I never understood why my mother was at the school all the time. Um, well, frequently, not all the time, but frequently to get my, my classes changed, my curriculum changed. Um, and, and by the time I graduated, I realized that the same counselor who just happened to be a white woman mm -hmm. um, was directing my friends who were white differently than she had with me. Wow. Um, yeah. And I, again, I didn't know what was going on or why she did that. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I, I think the biggest thing that, that, that kind of tortured me throughout school was that people had a different expectation of me than was mm -hmm. prescribed by my mother. Right. Um, and also, um, I, I, I didn't understand it. Um, so there, there, there's all these little pieces Mm -hmm. um, that that go from you know fourth grade through the rest of my life right. that 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 indicates something different, but you don't know what it is until right. and you don't want. I mean, one of the things I can honestly say is I don't want to think that I'm being treated differently because of my skin color, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, that sets me up. So when it does happen, I'm ill prepared for it yeah. and then have to respond. So in a sense, your, your mother stepped in early in your life to say, this is not my son's direction. I'm sorry. You know, he's, he's smarter. He's talented. Da, 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 da. Um, my mother set 
my mother set the standard, the expectation of her children yeah. and what they were supposed to and what they were going to do. Yeah. So it never was a question for me that I was going to go to college. Yeah. While for other people, it was something that they didn't even think was an, uh, something I would consider. She sounds like an amazing woman. Um, she was. Mm -hmm. She was she was ahead of her time. And yeah. I think had circumstances been different, um, she could have been, well, she was incredible, but she could have been more so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At some point, Peter, did you absorb that 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 le life lesson that she gave you about? So when people said, uh, we think you're less than what you think you are, you had something inside you to say, I'm sorry, that's, I'm all that I am. I'm going to. Well, I, I think that I was fortunate that I lived in a family and a, and a cloistered community that had the same goals and aspirations. You know, all of my, all of my friends who happened to be black um, all went to college. They all had um, a middle class um, 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 standard of living. So um, it, it's, it was just normal for us. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until I did go to college that I realized that that wasn't, that wasn't the real world. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think that I am so much better because of that naivete, because I, I, I know people who are African American or, or of other uh, minority groups who are bitter um, because they experience bitterness at a, such a higher rate than I did. Um, so for me, it was it was just a deflection. Um, but I knew I had in within me the wherewithal to know that I'm going this way. I you know, yeah. you, you may go that way or, but I, I always, I think that the bottom line is I have always had options. Mm -hmm. and some people don't have, some people have not been afforded the option to pursue things differently. And for those who haven't, um, it, is a, it is a huge struggle. Yeah. It is a huge struggle. And, and I've seen that represented in, in people who came into our lives. And um, even though they were introduced to things that were better, um, a better standard of living and a better standard of life, they were never able to get over that initial um, concept in their body that you can't do this. Right, right. Yeah, you had that built in largely because of your mom that Yes, you can do this. I know you can, and I want you to know you can. And, but it, it, it's more than that. It, it's from my mother's side of the family mm. um, that there was history of education being the, um, the way out of whatever you're doing. I see. Um, so that, that was really pushed um, for, I mean, that 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 was a that was the way it was. Yeah. Um, and and actually, um, my my mother's mother was the first to attend an after high school program. I don't know exactly what it was called. It wasn't college, but mm -hmm. it was um, an after high school um, level of education, um, and that was in the twenties. So. Um, so her, my mother's grandmother, or my great grandmother, um, came from a family that knew that that was the way out, and that continued um, certainly up our way. Yep. So yep. Wow. That, that was the that was the um, the phoenix rising that made, the, made all the difference in the world for yeah. my family and me. Yeah, yeah, that's quite a legacy there. 
it is a legacy and and certainly not one that a lot of people have been exposed to right so you went to college anything in those college years that stand out for you um where'd you go well i went to three schools um i went to i i decided i when i was growing up i i had a pre tract in high school to be an architect um but as a as a high school student um and and sitting at drafting tables i thought i i couldn't i couldn't stand and, you know, sitting at a desk for the rest of my life, um, which I think is ironic now because <laughs> I've done the entire time. So um, since I wasn't very good in math, um, I loved architecture. I loved drawing. Um, um, I love buildings and design and all that sort of stuff, but I wasn't mm -hmm. strong enough in math. Um, so the other thing that I was really good at was um, writing. So um, my mother went back to school and um, earned a degree in broadcast journalism from the University of Missouri, Kansas, while raising her three young kids and taking care of her grandmother. Um, and every now and then um, I would, well, each of us kids had a chance to go into the studio where she was producing things because she wanted to be a broadcaster. So. Wow. Um, I, since I loved writing from an early age and um, actually had a paper that I wrote in seventh grade that um, blew my teacher out of the water. Um, and she actually on parents, parents, a parent something read it yeah. to people. Um, and I think they, they thought it was remarkable, but it, <laughs> it was easy for me. Interesting. But at the same time, I realized that maybe they weren't expecting that much from a black child in a white school. Mm. But we don't need to go into that. So anyway, I had I went to school to be a journalist. Okay. Um, so um, this was so I graduated in the late seventies high school, and I was afraid of going to the south. Um, I was in Kansas City, the metropolitan area. And, um, but just a couple hours south um, of M Southern Missouri was very Southern. Yes. So I went to a school in Joplin, Missouri because I was afraid to go into the South. And I thought as a journalist, um, I need to test the waters. And I thought um, a three and a half hour drive was um, far enough to test the waters and <laughs> if I <didn't> like the waters, <laughs> I can uh, no. oh. get away. Um, so I went there. Um, that was that was definitely an education. Um, from there, I went and studied a year in France because I wanted my second language to be French. Um, I wanted my third language to be German because I wanted <laughs> to be a foreign correspondent living in Europe reporting mm -hmm. for an American company. And at that time, it was just ABC, NBC, and CBS. Yes. Right. Um, and by the time I finished college, um, CNN had started. Mm -hmm. But um, so I went to a Missouri a State, uh, Missouri Southern State College in, in, in Joplin, uh, a program in Paris, France for a year. And then I finished my education at Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa, with a double degree in journalism and a minor, which was almost a major in French. Wow. Wow. Quite a pack. Well, I, I stayed in the Midwest, um, except for that, you know, Paris thing. Yeah. What made you move to Washington, D.C.? Um, Washington, D.C. is, was, well, it was it was only supposed to be a temporary stopover. So this was in the early, oh, I guess mid, um, mid eighties. Yeah, because I, I graduated in 85, <laughs> it seems so long ago. Um, um, we, we, we didn't have the internet yet. Um, <laughs> so I thought um, we, we, we did the this thing where you would, um, type, you had this machine where you mm -hmm. would punch these things and something would hit 
a paper and there's ink <laughs> involved and you would write a series of sentences, um, you would fold that and put it into another piece of paper um, and mail that to someone, which is called a letter. <laughs> so um, I thought the opportunity to find a job in Paris was going to be um, um, better um, in, in an international city like Washington, D.C. than in um, Kansas uh, City, Kansas. Gotcha. gotcha. That makes so, sense. So Washington was a temporary stopover, but um, it, it kind of lasts maybe 35 years or so. <laughs> and here you, you still are, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, one of the things is I brought a lot of money for Kansas to Washington, um, only to discover it was not a lot of money for, right. for Washington. Exactly. So um, that sticker shock still, um, you know, it's still yeah. there. Yeah, it's but, an amazing difference. But that that's that's why I moved to Washington to okay. look for my journalism career um, um, for an American broadcaster living in France to be a foreign wow. correspondent. So here you are, some thirty years later. You haven't used your journalism. I, I mean, I've benefited from your writing over the years, but you had never got to do the actual reporting and journalistic work that you had set yourself out to be. But yes, I have. Oh, well, um, no. my, my, my education, um, it, interestingly enough, in college, I had friends who were pursuing a law degree, our law career, who took journalism as their undergraduate before they went to law school so that they can yeah. be able to present themselves in court and argue cases and be articulate and, and know what's going on. So right. my, my understanding of English, my understanding of manipulation of words and, and certainly um, being able to write well and, and because of my languages, because I, I learned how to mm. hear um, two different languages. Um, mm. um, I have used my journalism and language skills to um, benefit me in the industries that I've worked in. Because oh, no you, question. you no really question. have to understand what people are saying and, right. and most often what people aren't saying, but intend to say, and right. then ask the right questions to get at what they need. So. Um, my degree, my education has yes um, has served me well um, yes. in my industries. No, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, yeah. Um, yes, because as I said earlier, I benefited from those way back and uh, still do. <laughs> um, um, just a little bit. Yeah, just a little. Any. Any mentors, special people along this path that have been helpful in influencing you, supporting you, in a sense, the way your mom did early on in your life? Um, yes, actually, um, my first, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I, I was a, a writer for a, an association and we had an annual conference. Um, this was in the late 80s. Um, we had an annual conference that everyone was, everyone was involved with. And um, so it was a pretty big deal. And in the process, um, I transitioned from being a writer into logistics. And I met this woman who was the Convention and Visitors Bureau um, lead in, of all places, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Hmm. Um, and she... She and I, I was able to have several meetings in Albuquerque and we became friends. Um, I mean, friends that I knew her family and she would come mm. visit and all that sort of stuff. Um, she put into my mind that I could be an executive director of an association mm. um, because of my skill sets and I believed her. Mm -hmm. um, so that, yeah. 
that was very powerful. Um, Denise Shuttle um, um, from um, Albuquerque. Um, and then and then there's this 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 guy. Let's see, uh, his name it escapes me. Uh, Gary or Gary the the careless or the oh Gary de Carlos de Carlos uh -huh. de Carlos something like that. Um, after I start working with him, um, he saw something in me and. Um, he, if I remember correctly, um, called on me a lot to do new and exciting things that he had wanted to do in his career at the, uh, for the federal government. So I worked with him and a body of you know, people who were all my senior, um, you know, by five, 10, 15 years. Um, mm -hmm. And they showed me another way of doing things. Mm -hmm. So um, I actually have quite a few people who recognized something in me that um, propelled me to a different way. So um, I've been fortunate that, um, um, without a doubt, um, all my clients have really liked the, 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 the work that I've done for them and yep. um, have created opportunities. It's not that they created opportunities. They saw that together client and, and customer, that client and, and, and provider that um, we could create these things. Right. So I've been able to do that successfully throughout my career. And I mean, it's, it's been spectacular. Yeah, oh, that's great. You think of your career, um, are there any pearls of wisdom that come out of that? I mean, one you just mentioned is that um, by building relationships with your clients and putting your skill sets out there, it's, create, it's created opportunities for you that um, you wouldn't necessarily have thought you would be end up doing and sure. which opened new doors uh, along the way. There are other little pearls of wisdom that, that you uh, think when you think of your career that come up for you? Well, yes, I, I, think, I think the most valuable skill that I've developed, and, I, and again, I attribute this to learning um, foreign languages, is mm. the ability to hear and mm. listen to what people say um, and to be quiet enough to hear what people are trying to get across. So um, it, in any kind of service industry, those who succeed really pay attention to the details of what someone is telling them and then go go with that and, and ask follow-up questions and 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 that um i i now that i'm older and on the senior level of um you know the the economic scale um i've taken great pride in mentoring young people mm. um, for example um when um, we have new associates that can't, that come into the company um, that are either working in my area or not necessarily for me, but just in the same place in my business or my office, yeah. um, I, I hook onto them like white on rice mm -hmm. and tell them, you know, you need to set up your 401k. You need to have that money taken out before you get your first paycheck. You've never seen it. You won't miss it. And um, before long, you will have a nice little nest egg. I didn't start saving mm. seriously for my, my retirement until I was in my mid thirties because no one explained it to me. Right. Um, my mother, bless her heart, she did say, you know, just save five dollars every week, and you know, it it is truly those little steps yes. that you make economically. I mean, no one really teaches you how to manage money. 
Yep. Um, and many people um, falter because they've not known how to do that. And that that and it, and it has nothing to do with the amount of money you have. As That's long right. as you have enough money to pay for your expenses, expenses, the money above that is something you can do with. And right. so many people don't even have that. So, um, you know, not to change the subject, but um, Katie Portman, who is a um, senator, our Cong a representative from California, she has so well interviewed um, people in Congress and, and explained to them that at CEOs at their company that, um, how expensive it is to be poor. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, when CEOs are, are earning, and I think the latest record is like two or 300 times that of their least, least earning um, 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 employees, yeah. um, they have, they have, they just, they just can't imagine what it is like to try to survive on $15 an hour for 40 hours a week and, and the cost that it, that it is. So, um, so I mentor students about, um, you know, saving money and, and budgeting their money and setting up budgets. I've run a budget um, in Excel for 25 years. So I know how much money I have. I, have, I know what, how much money I have to expend. Whenever I make a major part purchase, I look back at my spreadsheets and see what I what room I have to wiggle in and can make a purchase based on on how much money um, I have to spend and not not just go out and buy you know a car or something like that right. um, because I want it. So wow. that's important. And I also mentor kids to kids, young adults to honor their parents, mm. um, to respect their elders, because um, even if, I mean, especially when your, your parent has paid for your education, someone needs to tell you that you need to give back. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I tell young employees, um, young associates is, you know, with your first or second paycheck, take your parents out to dinner and clearly let them know you're paying for it. Because nice. um, if we don't learn these things, yeah. um, we don't become human. Um, yeah. We, you know, no one is an island. Um, mm -hmm. it, it truly takes a village. And I've tried, I've had my life expanded by all the villagers from different areas and including you. Mm -hmm. um and um so I, I i i believe in giving back that's beautiful those are those are pearls of, of wisdom for sure thank you peter so you're uh, you still got some miles on that uh, career truck of yours i do if you had a magic wand what would you like to see the next five to ten years look like for you it's very interesting that you should mention that because I just um, participated in a um, training for a group that's called 40 plus here in Washington, um, which helps people who are 40 plus transition into new positions. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the exercises that we did yesterday was to look at um, what, what you know, without any barriers, what do you want to accomplish in three years, not five years, but three years, because that's something that's tangible. Yep. And so I've been thinking about that. Um, I, I want to, uh, I don't like the way this sounds, but I want to be a do-gooder, um, <laughs> but I also want to be a do-gooder who earns a lot of money. Yeah. Um, because I, I have learned through my family, my mother's side, as opposed to my father's side, with money, you have options. Without money, you are left um, rudderless in, in the water. So I want to 
use my money and my education and my skill sets to do good, mm -hmm. you know, environmentally or socially or something like that. Um, you probably can't see, but I have my I have some hats back there that uh -huh. indicate my um, my um, interest, um, um, including like the Black Lives Matter um, movement, which is which shouldn't be so di divisive. Um, but you know, it it's one thing that I can say that will trip me up every time is when I think that my education, my money, my house, my car will protect me from things. And it just takes one police officer to shatter that illusion. Yeah really quick yeah so um i i believe in um and i'm at the age you know i'm 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 over 50 i mean i'm actually 60 and i i know that you know we have to ha we have to have policy changes because um nothing has happened in the united states without a struggle nothing mm -hmm. Um, and it's an illusion to think that things are just going to happen because people um, feel good about it or something. Right. Exactly. And there, you know, I've heard many times that the things in life that actually mean a lot are preceded by a struggle. Right. Because there, there is that that whole, you know, you leave the port, and then there's tough, shaky waters that you're going to go through. But if you right. get through them something new and better on the other side right you know? so maybe that something in that area um nonprofit like black lives matter to put some of your energy towards make a difference well i'm actually well i'm unemployed um and i am i i just applied for a a job that's a major do-gooder um so i'm hoping that that will work out um because they are um, they focus, so it is a nonprofit, um, and mm -hmm. they focus on, um, you know, earth, land, water, sea, air, um, food insecurities, mm -hmm. uh, um, inequities, medical inequities, and stuff like that. And I think certainly, you know, the pandemic um, continues to show us on a daily basis what those inequities are and yeah. the overall costs. And I think one of the things that that has certainly been in the news recently is, you know, why should we be concerned about what's happening in India because it's so far away? But we are mm. so inter interconnected um, that what happens in India or or Europe or Asia or, or Africa um, does have an effect in the United States. And if we don't pay attention, um, things get out of hand. Absolutely. I think pandemic certainly taught that lesson yet again. Nobody's, uh, there's no firewall between any country, any there's continent. No, yeah. There's no firewall and um, people who think that they're protected are sadly living in an illusion. Right. So um, we're getting towards the end of our time together. This has okay. been wonderful and it's been fast. Um, are there any, any special quotes, anything that um, would help the audience, help them understand you and that define you, any experience that you had, anything you wanted to say to wrap up this nice time together? Yes, actually, and I have some show and tell. Oh, good. This book is Denzel Washington. Um, it's ha a hand guide to guide me, lessons that he has from other people. Mm. And the reason I bought this is I heard him say, oh, I wish I could remember exactly. Um, do what you have to do in order to do what you want to do. Mm. So I think that's really, really powerful. Wow. 
Um, um, I also have this little book, um, as a gentleman, let's see, as a gentleman would say, um, it's actually a friend get, um, gave this to his nephew and it's all these, you know, quotes are oh, yeah. for different situations. And he said, this is me. And I start reading it and I thought, oh my God, it's just so true. And some of it, it's just so simple, such as a gentleman never asks a woman if she's pregnant. Done that, made that mistake, won't do that again. <laughs> um, a gentleman does not use his cell phone when he's at the table with others. Neither does he check his text messages or exchange text messages with others. Mm. <laughs> Common sense. Um, so, um, and I, I think one of one one quote that I originally thought was from Oprah Winfrey because it was from her that I heard it first, but I did some research and found out it was from Eleanor Roosevelt. Hmm. And the quote is, and this is this is something that has truly guided me personally and professionally. Never take a no from someone who can't give you a yes. Mm. Wow. So in any level of service, business service, the first line of defense, defense for a company is to say no. Mm -hmm. And if you just take that first no, then, then you won't get anywhere. Yeah. But um, you know, it comes into the point where you get to a certain point and you say, excuse me, may I speak to a supervisor? Yeah. And that first line of defense is always going to try to truncate that and keep you speaking to them and mm -hmm. what I have done which I I know it's annoying but when people don't listen to me I just repeat the same question exactly verbatim mm -hmm. um that's nice may I speak to a supervisor oh mm -hmm. that's interesting may I speak to a supervisor mm -hmm. um so so I think that's my that's my favorite most useful quote that's um, wonderful because it, it's a mindset yeah, yeah. Now, I do see a plaque in the back there. What's, hey, uh, you want to share what that might be? Um, well, um, it is um, an award I, re I received from my religious organization that named me um, 2019 uh, President's Award. Wow. It says, in recognition of 13 years of committed service as a member of the board of directors, skills, skillfully oversight of numerous community events, and the effective, the effective collaboration with our center administrator. In addition, Peter's advocacy for social justice and his numerous acts of kindness offered to others in need are truly inspiring for all. Wow. From James to um, verse 17, faith without work is dead. Wow, that's beautiful, Peter. You got all that on that plaque. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for this time together. You're, you're welcome. So um, now what yeah. do we do? Well, I think we're going to probably say goodbye for now. Okay, and um, I I'm sure the audience is just thrilled over this past time together, and and uh, thank you again, Peter. You're a great friend and a wonderful man. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. See you soon. Um, give my regards to Vermont. All right, I will. Bye. Bye.